Hello and welcome. This is Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates on YouTube. This channel evaluates all aspects of true crime. As you are aware, videos and live streams in this genre often discuss elements of crime that may be disturbing to some viewers. If necessary, take the precautions needed to avoid these feelings. Factual information related to cases is the key to fostering rational true crime discussions. Fortunately, you will find that here. Please hit the like button only once, share the video, and subscribe if you like my content. Thank you very much for watching. Way down on the screen there. <clears throat> All right. Well, I'm gonna go. I gotta give Blue his medicine. I just remembered. So that's what we're gonna do right now. All right. Be back in just a second. What the heck? <laughs> what happened? You guys? <laughs> Thank you guys. Jeez. Hey, thank you, the Broken Scout. Dana 1972 and Quietly Frozen. The coolest name in YouTube history. Oh, and there was 
Is that another one? Or is that... That's the same one. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Well, there you go. Blues... You know... It's like every day you got to remember to give it to them exactly the right same time. Yeah, within reason. I mean... It's 5.45... Anyways, tonight I thought we'd go over the, I mean, there was, Court TV just had on Richard Allen's previous attorney, Labado, I think is his name. Yeah, William Labrado. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that it brought up a whole conversation they were having. I think Mike King, it was on Court TV, I think Mike King did well. He was the uh, one of the only rational people up there, or well, I mean, in, in terms of the two guests that they had, and then the attorney up there. He's just, uh, you know, selling a line of just absolute garbage. So, by the way, is there, how many people in here aren't really familiar with the Delphi case? I mean, like, you know, you're been watching me do the Idaho Four and aren't really up on this one. Thank you, Sirius Black. I'm just checking. Is there anybody that, um, I mean, I, I mean, that's one thing too, is like a lot of people that are in the Idaho case, they don't even click on a video if it's not that one. <laughs> So, but I'm just curious if there's anybody in here that really kind of watch me for that, but you don't really know much about this one. And even if you don't, I'm gonna, we'll just do the recap <coughs> that we do. And, well, cool, Jillian's book chatter. Yeah, we've covered this case for, you know, I, I've been covering it myself since, uh, you know, the night they went missing, you know, at least right then we were talking about it. And, and then I made my first video, I think, that came out was like uh, nine days later on YouTube. It was the flow of the crime. And I removed it because there was an error in, on just a small segment. And I just put it back out there again. Yeah. It's amazing how, like, it, this this case, it's pretty big on social media, but people don't even know anything about it out in the real... If you ask people in the real world, they go, yeah, I don't know, I don't really... But everybody knows about the Idaho 4 case. Everybody. This one, though, is, has so much more stuff in it. <laughs> it's crazy. I did talk to, was checking in with Becky earlier. She's doing well. Man, I didn't realize she had, she went through so much hell when she went through her, when she had like some uh, cancer for a while. I mean, she's in remission now, but you know, the radiation and chemo and all that crap. I mean, Jesus. Glad she uh, made it out of that. Oh, wow, Timothy, that's amazing. Now, let me tell you about the Idaho case. It's uh, That's the time I, I, I got one of Timothy's jokes <laughs> right off the get-go. That's like a miracle. Yeah, so if people check in on the video, at least we'll have the recap so they can, you know, at least know what the hell's going on in this case. Uh, if any of us really do know what's going on. I mean, this is just insane. <clears throat> Hello. 
And yes, you guys, if you'd like to help support the channel, just like uh, Scouting Dude, Quietly Frozen, and Sirius Black, and Dana 1972 did up there, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to be on the 8th and 9th. I'm not, not even sure I'll be able to do a video on the 10th, but I might try to stream live from my trip because this is my annual golf trip that I do, right? At Bandon. Usually when something huge breaks, <laughs> it's almost every single time I go to Bandon Dunes, something massive happens. Like, oh, wow. It's unbelievable. No, why do you let her distract you, Daphne? Just, you know, I don't get it. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. All right, so back on February 13th, 2017, Abby and Libby were hanging out. They were right here at this property right there. And they were hanging out. And they really didn't say verbally or anything like that that they had plans to go to the bridge or anything like that. They had spent the weekend hanging out and they were at a sleepover. And during that sleepover, uh, an individual named Anthony, well, a, a fake online profile named Anthony Schatz communicated with Libby's phone um, you know, just like a two days prior to the murders. And then on this day, though, they, uh, they're just hanging around the house, helping out, doing things. And at some point, Kelsey says, or Derek leaves, and they didn't ask him, hey, can we get a ride to the bridge? And then later, probably, I don't know, after one for sure, Kelsey was going to head over to her then boyfriend's house and Libby asked, hey, can we go, to, can you drop us off at the bridge? And Becky would only let them go if they had a ride there and a ride back. And she said she had a ride back, but she didn't really have one, but she knew that she could just call her dad and her dad would drop everything and go pick her up. And so on the drive there, she called her dad, and her dad was going to come pick him up. She was going to be, he was going to be there within an hour and a half to two hours um, after the phone call. So you know, uh, according to the probable cause document, we originally thought it was 1.37 when the girls were dropped off at the parking area, which is right here. This is... Uh, Mears property and here is the parking area and it was right here where uh, the girls were dropped off and we thought it was 137 but it turns out it's more like 148 uh, you know about 148 they probably were dropped off here and then people go Gray's going to get put in jail, everybody. He's going to be put in prison because he and Becky Patty came up with um, a timeline to trick people that it wasn't accurate. <laughs> I mean, it's 11 minutes. And, and what difference does it make, you know? What difference does that 11 minutes make in this case? Nothing. Okay. Right. So that's what we thought, but it was actually one, and she was basing it off of a phone call, but maybe Libby actually, or Kelsey was talking to her boyfriend on the drive over, and that was more of the 137 time. That actually makes complete sense. Hey, thanks, Kim Christian. All right, so then the girls get dropped off there. This is just the memory. This is how it was at the beginning of the case. Okay, this is all we knew. As they were dropped off, and then they make it to the bridge over here, and there's a photograph taken 
um, on the bridge, one facing that way and one facing this way. The, this, the one facing this way was second, and that was at 2.07. And it was Libby standing on this platform right here, filming Abby coming, right? Maybe I should go get the, uh, let me open up that folder. And you can see it. All right, so this, this right here is the, the photograph. It's a really poor quality one. Let me get a better one. I think this one. What in God's name? And why is my phone binging? Let me turn this off. Yeah, so that was the photograph taken by uh, Libby's phone from platform three back that way. And you don't see anybody in that picture right there. And the picture that was taken prior to that is... I'm just looking, I have so many pictures in there, it's crazy. Is that it? Yeah, this one right here. So that was the one that was a full length of the bridge and you don't see anybody on that one either, right? So that was a full length of the bridge. We know exactly where this is, we found this exact piece of ivy on the, the railroad ties there and then on this picture we were able to find this piece of wood here that's all destroyed right there and so we know exactly where all these photographs were taken and in those photographs you don't see anybody right however uh, according to a document at just uh, six minutes after this. Why does it keep pinging here? I turned off the damn audio. Let me let me turn off my Facebook. I can't stand. I don't know how to wor work phones and how to turn off notifications. It just drives me batty. I mean, I don't know how people deal with this. It just... All right, there we go. Turn those suckers off. All right, so that was it right there. And there was nobody in the pictures. And then we know at uh, just six minutes later, according to a, there was a guy named Ron Logan, all right? So there's a guy named Ron Logan, and this is his property right here okay uh, that the bot the place where the girls bodies were found is his property all right so he became somebody interesting to a lot of online people etc so there was a you know even law enforcement wanted to look into him so they did a search warrant and in that search warrant it mentioned that at 213 uh, near the end of a 43 second long video uh, near the end of it, you can see a suspect on the bridge, and here it is right here. That's what it. That's exactly what it looked like right there. There's a. Then they eventually get put out a video about two years after the murders, where we can see the movement, and that's my animation there, where I took their image, 
stabilized the bridge behind him and then you could see how he moved. So if we go back, it's right here. And so this is right at the other end of the bridge. About 60 feet from the end of the bridge is when you see that. Okay. So if you notice, the square that's moving around, that was still in the version that law enforcement gave us. I move it around so that he looks, see how uh, the platform in the background is stable and that fork tree. Uh, so I was able to do that. It was a good enough angle and, and the photo we have is really close, the image. So, you know, he catches up to him right at the end of the bridge here. And let me, there's audio. So here's the audio. Guys. guys. So he says, guys, down the hill. Uh, yeah, Daniel, do you need something? Of course those are people in the background. <laughs> How come everybody always asks that? It's just amazing to me. Can you tell that the, the video that I just put was an overlay on the, you know, like it's, what, look at it. See this right here? I just used a still uh, image from when we, I had a friend go out to the bridge. Look, this is an overlay. It's not really there, you see? Uh, this isn't really, there's no people in the background when this guy was here. This is just so you could see how he moved and I used this tree back here as a reference. Oh, cool, Kimi. But hey, Danny, you're not alone, man. That's probably been asked to me a hundred times. Hey, I can see people back there. It looks like three people. I know, because it's not the same day. That's why it's an overlay of the video. Hey, thank you so much, 1L Michelle. And that's your third super on a live stream. So anyways, it's really creepy. And I know the sequence is, and I have an animation of it. So let me, uh, if you want to just see that, I can show that really quick. And then you get a really a better idea. Because Libby was standing off the end of the bridge and Abby was still on the bridge. And oh, I don't know if I have those out there anymore. That's right. Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. I'm not sure they're still online. I might repost them though. I do have it though. Hold on. There it is. Alright, so this is kind of what it looks like. So that's that first shot of the full length of the bridge, you guys, right there. And thanks again, 1L Michelle. And then there's platform three right in front there, right? So Libby gets on that platform, and I think she was always in front of Abby because Libby had been there many times. And Abby had only, this is the first time she's ever going to cross the bridge. And then there's the photograph or, you know, an image, digital image on Libby's phone. And, you know, then she likely probably said, okay, let's keep going. And and they're walking now I think after this sometime just like I have it here I think at some point they can see Richard Allen walking behind them back there you see that oh you can't see it god dang it you did you didn't nobody typed in look at look at look it <laughs> all right hold on let me start over again all right let me start over all right here we go this is the the bridge that just shows that nobody's really paying attention. 
the full length of the bridge. There's the still frame that was uploaded to Snapchat. All right, yeah, but nobody said, look at, look at, look at, we can't see you. And then here's platform three right here. And there is Libby taking a picture of Abby. And that's the photograph right there. And there's nobody behind them back there. See that? And they continue across. Now look in the background there. In this 3D animation, there is a... Uh, Have you ever, you ever followed this case, uh, Danny? We'll get to all that in a little bit. I just want you to see this part. So that's him. Like, he's catching up to him. And I just put a hat on him. You know, people were saying he was maybe wearing a hat like that. So this is how it went, though. Like, Abby was still in the group, guys. So he says, hey, guys. And then they're like, hey. And then apparently he pulls out a gun. There's a clicking sound. And then... Abby says, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. And then he says, down the hill. But they cut out all the part where Abby and Libby speak. All right, so does this give you a pretty good perspective? So we're just, if you go, this is north-south oriented here. They're right over here, and they're walking across the bridge. And this is platform three and the first photograph was taken right around in this area right here facing that way the one on platform three is back this direction and it's not a really like isolated area out there there's houses all over the place you know it's not like you're in the middle of nowhere it's uh yeah i'm sure you were danielle you Spend the whole show saying hello, 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 hello. Yeah, and there it is. Uh, platform three facing back towards the start of the bridge again. And then they get on to the bridge. That's the photograph that you were, that I was just sort of emulating there in the animation. Or imitating, I guess. And uh, then they get going and they start walking across. And at some point, the killer, which I put him back there, he's like right here. You know, they're almost at platform four. They're walking, and he starts going. And it could be like they were even further because it took them six minutes to get to here where you can walk across that bridge in three or four minutes. So he's coming. So, down the hill. Alright, so there you go. Hopefully that all made sense to everybody. And then after that, he takes them down the hill right here. And then, early on, uh, the, the way I figured out the flow of the crime in this case was I... I knew I was able to find where they were found because a, a reporter took a photograph and in that or a video actually they took a video right here and I could see this tree that overhangs the creek right here and right there and so the crime scene was over here and because of that then I realized this little shallow sandbar right here was likely the spot and if that is you know the person was aware of that they must have been out there before right and he took them over here and they were killed and then for years like nobody knew anything about you know like there was all these different people that were arrested or not arrested and looked into um, you know uh, it's like too many to name there's like six people that the public were interested in but the police probably weren't and that's how it remained for basically five years. You know, they'd had a press conference at one point, 
uh, which now in hindsight was pretty interesting. The first one was just sort of the basic stuff, but in the second one, that's where we got that video that we were just looking at. And they also said if anybody knew who the driver of the vehicle that was parked at the abandoned CPS building, which is this building right here, between 12 and 5, uh, let them know. And I thought it meant like they already know whose vehicle it is. They just want, um, or they already know the vehicle type. But they just want to know who the driver was, maybe to spook whoever it was to see what they might do with the a vehicle. But that isn't really, that's not, they really didn't know whose vehicle that was at that time. Uh, then it was like, you know, five years later, maybe not even five, it was more like four years later, that's when this, a law enforcement put out this video on YouTube that mentioned an online profile named Anthony Schatz. And remember, Anthony Schatz is the profile that was talking to Abby and Libby that same weekend. So they wanted to know if there were people out there that had communicated with Anthony Schatz and specifically if maybe you met that person. And the Anthony Schatz profile turns out to be uh, was created by a person named Keegan Klein, right? And Keegan Klein, his house was raided, uh, I believe, on the 23rd or 20, yeah, like the 24th maybe of February. So him and his dad went to Las Vegas. They came back, and their house got raided. And this was back in 2017. So just literally, you know, uh, 10 days after the murders, you know, the bodies were discovered, they're at the house and they found a treasure trove of child pornography on cell phones and other devices. And they actually found a reference apparently in the investigation to a Dropbox account that led to one of the largest child pornography rings in Indiana state history. But in that house, there were all kinds of phones and that they discovered. And then part of the narrative talks about how Keegan Klein was then polygraphed and asked questions about the Abby and Libby murders. And he already knew that prior. And then he gets taken down to the, to the polygraph test. But he didn't, uh, of all the phones and everything they found at the house, they didn't have the... I think it was, um, the, the, you know, the phone that he was using during the time of the murders, he, set, he had hidden somewhere. <laughs> like, he didn't give it to them. He was okay with all the CSAM material that they had on all of the different devices. He was okay with that. Hey, thanks, Cindy Leon. But he just didn't want them to have the cell phone that he had been communicating with the girls on. And so he comes back from the polygraph test. They drop him off. He goes into the house. And then two hours later, they know from forensic information that he started to uninstall and install, delete, etc., all the different apps that were on his actual phone because he, he located it. <laughs> and uh, after two days of doing that, he gives the phone back to law enforcement, who then forensically were able to determine he did exactly what I just said. So that, that's interesting. There's also one of the only other interesting elements of what they found is there's like a Samsung Galaxy phone that Keegan Klein factory reset, but he claimed he factory reset it while in Las Vegas because he found the phone on a, uh, in a taxi cab or something. I mean, it was just a ridiculous... Thanks. Or a rental car, or whatever hell. I think it was a taxi cab. Uh, but anyways, he claims he factory reset it after he found it there. Now, I always thought it was for some other nefarious reason that he transported CSAM material on it. But uh, we don't know. So hold on. Ah. So it seemed like the Keegan Klein thing was this great 
Engel, man, we this is gonna do it, man. It's Keegan Klein. It's gonna be somebody associated with the with him, etc. Maybe you know, people thought maybe a family member of his, etc. And it just didn't seem to be going anywhere. And then it was amazing. Keegan Klein was removed from his local jail and taken into custody by the Indiana State Police and taken out to like, what was it, Grissom? Like some kind of Air Force base out here somewhere. And he was asked questions by a whole bunch of different federal agencies, etc. And right at that exact time, they started searching the Wabash River. I think it was right here, if I remember right. They were searching the Wabash River for an item associated with uh, Keegan Klein in the water. They spent like almost a month looking in there. And then it seems uh, right before, I guess apparently a week before they stopped searching the Wabash River, they got a tip narrative. A tip came in. Somehow they went back and found a tip narrative from uh, Officer Dan Doolin who mentioned that they had found um, a narrative written by him that talked about, like he interviewed Richard Allen, a guy, a person named Richard Allen. And Richard Allen claimed that he was there from 1.30 to 3.30 and that he past three girls that were there. That's what he mentioned all the way back then. And it's amazing because somehow that tip didn't make it anywhere. It didn't make it into any systems of any kind uh, other than the original one. I mean, it got put in there. Well, I guess it made it into a system. It just didn't make it to somebody's eyes that could look at it. And Dan Doolin's really kind of disappointing himself because he didn't do anything like it seems like a year later or something wouldn't he go wow yeah there's this one guy though he said he was there from 1 30 to 3 30. anyways they reviewed the tip narrative and uh they ended up you know eventually they arrested richard allen or they searched his home first i believe somewhere around like the 13th or 14th of october October of 2022 and you know they got st st uh, stuff out of there apparently and then they arrested him later in the month and in those interviews he said more things but you know we could go over those now and now in the probable cause document we have way more technical information here now people say you know I mean I heard from Somebody that would know, they said that they, this is an investigator type, you know, literally. Uh, they said that they are unable to find a connection between Keegan Klein and Richard Allen. And to me, that's always just been something that's, you know, everything's possible, but man, what are the odds of that? That you have somebody who had just communicated with the girls using the Anthony Schatz profile, and according to an interrogation of Keegan Klein, a massive 198, you know, almost 200 page document, he um, was told that um, he, one of the friends of Libby um, contacted him and said, hey, did you hear what happened to uh, Libby? And he said, no, I was supposed to meet him that day. You know, like, oh, wow, I was supposed to meet him that day, but they never showed up. So here's the thing. is like the Keegan Klein, Anthony Schatz profile was supposed to meet Abby and Libby, but merely didn't get to meet Abby and Libby because a random serial killer-like person named Richard Allen uh, killed him first. Or could it be that Richard Allen had somehow had communications or a link to the Dropbox account that allowed him to 
uh, get information and knew that Abby and Libby were going to be there that day. That's what I've always thought. And I think there might be still something that they, you know, if you do it analog, right, where you're just, somebody tells you something and you're not really sending anything digitally, then there's really no way to prove anything. Hey, thank you so much, Don. Appreciate the uh, support. And by the way, we've given uh, thousands of dollars to the Abby and Libby ballpark over the years. And uh, we actually have, I think, two or three bricks out there. Maybe just two. We could have had a lot more bricks. I just forgot to ask on all of our other times. Nah, you don't know that, Scooby-Doo. Don't, don't just throw crap like that out. We, we have no idea. Come on. Jesus. You know. <laughs> That's just, uh, you know, just throwing stuff out there. We don't have any idea. There's always the rumors out there. What we, what we don't like on this channel is when there's rumors and then somebody spouts it out, out as if it's true because they heard it somewhere. That doesn't work. Okay. I think if that was true, every news outlet would be talking about it. Yeah. Right, Cindy. That's because you believe it. You, know, you believe something like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is true, but if it was true, wouldn't the news media be actually talking about that? Like, if you, if you could uh, uh, verify it. Yeah. Richard's cousin's brother. Give me a break. Jesus Christ. Richard, Richard's brother's cousin's jokes, aunt's sister. Oh, that's the joke. <laughs> well, how? You, come on, Cindy. You got to put a smiley face at the end. That, that kind of stuff right there is exactly what you say often and are serious. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> my, my joke off of your joke was exactly the joke you were making, though, right? Richard's cousin's brother also said that. You needed to add more. You should have said, Richard... Cousins, brothers, dog walkers, best friends, sisters, dogs, cousin. You know, something like that. You got to keep going and then it makes it like. Yeah. No, there's no way we would know you're kidding, Cindy. You actually believe stuff like that and type it in often. So it's hard to know. Yeah, especially since the joke wasn't, you didn't follow through enough where you added two or three more levels, then that would have been obvious. But his cousin's brother, you know. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Jacqueline Young. But I'll, I'll give you a, a C for the effort, Cindy. You just needed a couple more layers, and then it would have had the... I got it, Gray. I really did. I knew she was kidding, Gray, you bastard. Right, right, right. Anyways, um, so hey, guess what we're, I think we should do is we're going to go through a couple of those documents again. Because uh, doesn't it always rejuvenate your faith in this when you, whenever you see it? Forget the Odinism bullcrap. Okay, but first... I guess we do have to listen to this, okay? So this is Court TV, all right? Here we go. Listen, listen. And I'll play some of Mike King's responses. They're pretty good. Bradley Rosie and Andrew Baldwin. All right, so she is, this is Barbara McDonald. She's talking to Richard Allen's ex-defense attorney. Issued a press release not too long into their getting the case. And they said they believe that Richard Allen is innocent. Do you have an opinion on that? I do. Um, I don't think Mr. Allen had anything to do with this. Where what? I'm not playing the video. I'm just, you're just going to listen to the audio. What do you mean where? What, what, do you, what do you mean? I honestly don't. Now, what I believe, nobody cares. That's true. My job would have been to convince 12 jurors of that. 
Yeah, I don't You're care at all. You're a defense attorney, so that's your job to sort of say your client is innocent. Is that something you say about all your clients? Since. No, and rarely do I believe it. But in this particular case, I believe it. 100%. And what convinced you? Wow, I don't normally believe it, but this time I do 100%. Like, what was, well, let me ask you this. What would you expect this guy to say? Would he say, man, normally I think my clients are guilty as hell, but this time I don't. Or, hey, I think he's guilty, but I'm going to tell you. I mean, it's just, it's obvious. He's just saying exactly what a defense attorney says, right? That's it. There's nothing crazy or... Conversations with him. The fact that he lived in this very small Labrado community. Labrado or something. Is that's not name. much bigger than a high school. Yeah, William Labrado. He worked at the okay. CVS the in Delphi. Thing. The police sketches are hung up in the CVS. Yeah, yeah. The bridge guy picture is in you know what's funny is these guys almost seem like the same people of the conspiracy nutters in this case you ever notice that the attorneys and the things they say like this guy's like his picture was in there and you're saying that not one person said hey you kind of look like that guy in the cvs and in five and a half years no one comes into that store and says that kind of looks like you that's because he was wearing, uh, you know, hats and things and, you know, how, how would they know it looked like him? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, it's hard to say. Um, his wife might be the only person, perhaps, that looking at him might go, yeah, that guy kind of looked like him. And I don't know if this has any relevance and, you know, I'm not a conspiracy. I mean, the only thing, you can't see his face, right? You can see clothing and maybe somebody that knew him and the way he walks and things might say that but his face is too blurry in that video conspiracy theorists but an arrest was made 24 27 days before a sheriff election just my humble opinion that that pay, played some kind of role in his arrest so he and he hadn't moved he hadn't changed his story no, no facts or evidence have changed to my knowledge that brought him, brought law enforcement back to him five and a half years later. He has no criminal record. Um, they raided his house, took all of his social media. There's no ties to this Odinistic cult whatsoever. He didn't even know that there was Odinus in Delphi. He had never heard of it. Just a lot of things don't make. Okay, so now you're going, what, what Odinism? What, what the hell is that? Like if you're somebody new watching. Right, so when Richard Allen's def defense team took over after he was arrested, they were going through the documents and they found this narrative that by sort of a offshoot in the police department and own little, their own little group of investigators were looking into the Odinist angle. Everybody knew about this stuff way back then especially some of the crazy conspiracy nutters that are still um, around in the case right now. So they took it uh, to heart and were like, whoa, these... And I'm talking about the crazy YouTube conspiracy nutters. And they contacted the defense team and said, look at this, look at this. This is awesome. Check out the Odinist stuff. And then they found, sure enough, in the documents, uh, some Odin stuff that they looked into and then so now they're gonna go down that route and then it turns out that the um, he's in a jail and then they move him to a prison uh, but according to Mike King in here uh, most people prefer prisons over the jail because at least there's like consistency in there and a regime uh, you know regiment regimented activity where in jail you get these new people coming in you don't know what's going on etc 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 but anyways, he is in prison, and apparently a couple of his guards had Odin patches. And one of them, after they removed the patches, put a tattoo, an Odin tattoo on him. But let me ask you this. Let's just say it's all true. I mean, I, I'll even concede that, yes, the 
prison guards had that on. Um, and what does that mean, though? <laughs> like, what does it have to do with... Okay, so Abby and Libby, let's just say, pretend for a second that they were killed by some weird Odinist cult. Why would there be guys in the jail watching? Wouldn't they be treating... And if they were there... Wouldn't they treat Richard Allen like a celebrity and buy get him extra biscuits, uh, another slice of ham? You know, treat him like a freaking king in there because he is going to take the rap for the Odinists. I mean, what reasoning? I, I, that's one thing. I, I Nobody's ever answered this question. What were they doing in there? Okay, they're intimidating him. To do what? He's already in there. It doesn't make any sense. It's just sort of like, oh, wow, let's make a connection. Let's connect it, even though we can't tell you why they're connected. All right, so anyways, uh, this guy's talking about some of that stuff. Because he's the defense attorney that was just on there. Oh, right, right, Odin has run the prison. Yeah, yeah, you're right, 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 right. Yeah, they think the Odin... And here's where it, where it really comes down to then, is that somehow leadership, uh, people in leadership, put Odinists in there. So what to believe that the Odinists were intentionally put with Richard Allen, you then have to believe this highly complex government-involved conspiracy theory. And they just are so uncommon and rare okay it's not happening all right there'd be so many people that would be involved and know know this stuff just think about that for a second i've said this before on the show can anybody explain that i mean it looks like criminal networks one of the people that believes that shit right so anyways what do you guys think who cares criminal network why don't you go network somewhere else, okay? I'm not interested in your, you know, your bullshit that you're throwing out there, okay? There are so many kooks that somehow believe this whole thing. Right, exactly. Happened pretty close. All right, you guys, so I'm going to do the... If you're out there and you want to, you can help support my channel, Grady's Investigates. It allows me to keep doing these shows and um, you know, allows me to, uh, at the end of the month, I donate a quite a huge chunk of the income that my channel brings in. And we make a big difference out there. And it's the only way to make it happen. So if you're out there and you can help support my channel, that'd be great. If not, then hit the like button. But do something, for God's sakes. Let's see. There are so many kooks. Do you think there was a third girl that they met up with? Who? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I don't think there was a third girl. I don't know what the hell... Where, where are these things coming from? Tonight. It's weird that Richard Allen didn't see any of who... Who are you talking about? Can can somebody explain these comments that are coming in? They're just bizarre. Thank you, Bucolic Buffalo. Well, of course I question Dan Doolin. I think Dan Doolin is, um, you know, just... <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, there might be a, a, uh, an explanation out there that works or something, but to me, he failed miserably Dan Doolin did thank you Sounds. bucolic buffalo who said I watched part of the earlier thinking they'd have Logan as murder by the end watch part of that earlier thinking that I have Logan as murder oh maybe you mean the defense team and thanks, Cindy Lean. And you guys, jump on that wave with Cindy Lean. We got to get there. We're only 66%. Brad, 
Lovely Rosie and Andrew Baldwin also said that um, that there's no electronic evidence linking him to the crime scene or the girls, and that there's no DNA of his at the scene. Is that accurate? Yes, as far as I can tell. Yes. Yeah. No. The uh, I've made these, I've made the comparison between the Delphi case and the Idaho Four case in terms of the public and the defense team. And it's just wild. <laughs> they, oh, the crazy the crap out there. I watched part of that earlier thinking they'd have Logan as murderer by the end. She's got the wave button out, you guys. All right, we're going to bring in some more guests to join uh, me and Barbara here. Joining us in Orange County, California, the author of... Yeah, forget that. Uh, let's see. I want to hear from Mike King, though. He, he knew what he was talking about. Substantial evidence in these kinds of cases. All right, here we go. You got to take into account how can all these things happen and we've talked about circumstantial evidence in these kinds of cases before and i don't know whether and this is where when vinnie let uh read off a list of um of things uh, they there actually was missing quite a few elements too like i think you definitely have to always bring up the three girls that they walk by uh they brought up the bullet shell ejected they brought up his timing out there uh, and different things. And then Mike King saying, yeah, you got to look at the coincidence. Richard Allen's responsible for this or not. But I do know that you just named five things that are incredibly coincidental that he would happen to be in the same place at the same time. And when we get and when we get to see the ballistics on this unspent round that was cycled through, I, I don't know mask. if that means that it's a, an artifact of scraping on the sides of the, the cartridge itself that is the artifact. If there was an actual attempt to fire that bullet and there's indentations on the firing pin, but it was a misfire, it's going to be really important when that thing comes into court and there are both sides shouting out at the top of their lungs that that is uh, that 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 kind of a comparison is of no value Thanks, and others saying it absolutely is but if you've got markings that that gun is the only gun on the earth that will make and those well the odin story just came out early on because i think it was one of like abby's boyfriend's dad's Dad was sort of in. It was into that kind of stuff, and everybody was looking into it. And law enforcement looked into it and discarded it. They weren't interested. They didn't, you know. They they disproved it. End up on those cartridges that are found next it's, it's to the ridiculous. bodies. That's incredibly powerful evidence. Now I want to put this up on the screen because there is one other piece of evidence I think is something that needs to be explained. On April third, twenty twenty three. Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen, and this is while he's locked up. Now, here we go. In that phone call, Richard Allen admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the phone call transcribed, and the transcription confirms that Richard mm -hmm. Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abigail Williams. And if you guys remember, uh, the defense team in court, that was Rosie and Baldwin, said, yeah, we admit that that's damning. They said that in court. Now all of a sudden, no, oh, we were coming up with other explanations. In Liberty German, he admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offenses as charged. His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly. Barbara McDonald, what did William uh, Labrado have to say about that? See, now now Barbara McDonald, she asked Labra Labrado, I guess, the about the confessions. Back. Uh, he said he has a lot of questions about it, that his understanding is it was basically one sentence that Richard spoke, well, this confession, it. so not a lot of detail provided in that confession. And he says that Richard Allen was receiving medication while he's in prison, uh, both shots and pills. He doesn't know what those medications were. He tried to find out. And uh, so he has a lot of questions about what all was going on. He also says false confessions are a real thing, especially when people are subjected to very uh, harsh prison conditions. I mean, if you tell me that Richard Allen is an Odinist, then I might think, gosh, you know, maybe there is something to this. But they're saying he's not an Odinist. They've, and this is what I've said many times, right? 
They're saying he's not an Odinist. So then what do the Odinists have to do with Richard Allen while he's in prison, though? Oh, they're waiting around, making sure that he confesses and that he doesn't try to backtrack and get out of it some... I mean, it's just... It's so stupid. It doesn't make any sense. For the love of all things good, he's on video taken by a victim. Right, but it's blurry enough where he can claim it's not him. Um, so anyways, uh, remember I told you earlier Dan Doolin interviewed him. He didn't mention what he was wearing on that interview, apparently. He just said that he was there between 1.30 and 3.30 and that um, he passed three girls. And Dan Doolin goes, ooh, Note to self, let's find out who those three girls are. No, Dan Doolin. Yeah, let's figure out who the guy who just said he was there was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Dan Doolin? I mean, he was even on the bridge. The guy looked just like that guy. I mean, the, guy, the person on the bridge was a guy, right? It wasn't three girls. <laughs> Come on, Dan Doolin. Uh, anyway, uh, Susan Smith... For the love of things good, he is on video taken by the victim. Digital evidence. Yep. Uh, wise child and my little cutie, thank you very much. If he isn't connected to Keegan Klein, why would Richard Allen not utilize the more believable Anthony Schatz alternative? Yeah, and see, that might be because that, ca that one has got complete digital information and they just weren't able to prove stuff in that one so they're going to go to the nebulous uh, odin theory where you can make up anything that's why they probably did that yeah not one person in his family or his friends are screaming his innocence nor has he been screaming Right. It's just like, he's just like, uh, um, like Koberger, right? Like Koberger, I mean, he doesn't say anything. I didn't do it, you guys. I didn't do it, man. I didn't do it. He doesn't say anything. He just sits there with that stupid ass smirk on his face staring into the camera. That is electronic digital evidence. If he isn't connected to King Klein, why would Richard Allen not use it? Yeah, so. Killer... If I click on that, does it... Oh, there it is. If he isn't connected to Keegan Klein, why would Richard Allen not utilize the more believable Anthony Schatz alternative killer defense over the conspiratorial Odinus? Yeah. Yeah, the one thing about the false confession in this case, though, that... I, I've just, we've seen him here on Court TV, but it's Chewbacca? usually under... If he isn't connected, <laughs> why Richard Allen not utilize the more believable Anthony Schatz alternative killer defense over the conspiratorial Lodinist sacrifice theory? An interrogation scenario. This is a, a call to his wife. Um, Mike King, your thoughts on that? Um, because this is going to be significant. No one has heard this thing outside of investigators, and I, I presume maybe at some point the defense will hear it. Um, what are your thoughts about this, this confession, and what would be important about the circumstances for you surrounding it? I think that the most important thing that comes out of this is it wasn't one confession. By every account that I've read and other testimony I've heard on, on different media sources is that it was at least five times. Maybe See, I don't remember hearing five times. I remember hearing that he confessed to his wife and his mom. But, um, you know, maybe maybe there are other times. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Maybe six times that he made these confessions or admissions Thanks, Georgina and Kathy that Freiden he was maker. the guy. And I think that's going to be really difficult to overcome, Vinny. You can say... Okay, so that's good. And let me... Let's get some more of the attorney's comments here. Hey, about Odinism. Odinism. You had not heard of Odinism when it first was floated with regard to this case? I honestly thought... I was like... No disrespect to Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Rosie because they're, they're excellent lawyers. I thought it was hocus pocus. I, I honestly didn't, I, I'd never heard of it. Um, and the more I it is hocus got pocus. into it, 
um, that's that's a real thing. It is a real thing, and it's scary. In what way? Well, I believe they sacrificed a girl and killed another one. Um, they, some of the uh, people that live in Delphi uh, were ver very brazen about uh, their Odinistic belief. I guess it does say in the New York Post, it says, Richard Allen told his wife, Kathy, and his mother, okay, but he told them no less than five times that he was responsible for killing 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old uh, Liberty German after he found them hiking alone just outside their hometown of Delphi. Well, it was actually in Delphi. It wasn't outside of anything. Um, let's see. Beliefs on their Facebook pages and others. I mean, I guess technically, if you, you know, like here's Delphi right here, and it's right there, you know. Social media accounts, including the sergeant who was in charge of keeping Mr. Allen safe in Westville. Um, it, it, it's it's real. Just the other day, Robert and I were going to lunch, and we saw a uh, Jeep Wrangler here, right here in Fort Wayne with a spare tire on the back, and the cover was said Odin, and it had all Odin spears like who, around who on the cover. Who cares? I would have never known what that meant. Ooh, and, wow! Outside of this case, so Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Rosie were onto something right away. You um. Described one of those officers that's mentioned in um, one of Rosie and Baldwin's filings, uh, Sergeant Jones, mm -hmm. who was wearing patches that said, in Odin we trust, on yep. his Department of Corrections uniform. Yep. Uh, the judge ordered the warden to make them stop. And then what did you notice? That Mr. Jones uh, had a tattooed under his right eye. Um, from the best we can tell, it uh, looks a lot like Odin's spear. And he had several tattoos on his forearms, uh, including the interlocking triangles that are on his Facebook post. I got to give credit to Mr. Rosie and Mr. Baldwin that, you know, they picked up on that. Uh, we saw him and, you know, confinement officers at the Allen County Jail aren't even allowed to have facial hair let alone facial tattoos. I was a little miffed that the warden allowed that, or, you know, he even knew what it was. <laughs> he looks a little yeah. scared talking about Odinism. Yeah, so. Let me see if they interview him again. Have meaningful conversations with your client. Uh, anyways, the rest of it's just kind of about like, you know, not being able to have great conversations because he's so far away and everything. Hold on. All right. So, you know, that's kind of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And by the way, okay, so, I mean, th this case is nuts, you guys. I think it was back in October. Well, when I was in Idaho um, the first time, I think it was Ida uh, September 7th, I heard that a document was going to be coming out by the defense team that was going to have like talk about Odinism and all this weird shit, right? And then then I went to Delphi. I drove all the way from Oregon to Indiana. Uh, and then I was out there and while on the way there, the document came out. It was September like 20 something. It came out. So it actually, the document that I'd heard about was gonna come out, came out. 
And it turns out that the defense team underhandedly put out a document that had a bunch of sensitive information in it that was covered by the gag order, but they intentionally put it out there, let a few podcasters know, I think we know who, who they are, and they downloaded that really quickly, and then the judge, of course, then took it offline because it was supposed to be under the gag order, and it had out all this sensitive information, especially the Odinism stuff. So all this Odin crap was in that document, and now look what it has done. The defense team, it worked. Whatever they did, it worked. It created, because there's a lot of really dumb people in society that believe stuff like that. That's the problem. So they believe in that kind of thing, like, uh, oh, yeah, the Odin thing. I like that one. That's, that's more interesting. That's more fun. And so they put that out there. Uh, prior to that, though, we learned lately. Okay, so just in short, it went like this. The judge removed the attorneys from Richard Allen and said they, she removed them from the case and assigned two new attorneys because of their abhorrent behavior just absolutely and they, it is their behavior is disgusting and irresponsible and it's uh, negligent I mean it's just it's horrible right um, so they were removed but then the Indiana Supreme Court put them back in because she didn't have a hearing and let them argue their side she just removed them be well she didn't actually remove them she was going to remove them regardless, that's why I say that, but they actually resigned from the case because she gave them a choice. She goes, I'm going to remove you in open court after we go over all the stuff that you did, and or you guys can talk about things or something, you know, and then they decided, okay, we're going to withdraw from the case, right? But then after that, they filed motions and everything, and the Supreme Court looked at it and said, yeah, you, sh you should have had a hearing, and then you could have removed them, but also it's his, you know, the Sixth Amendment comes in where, you know, he has the right to his counsel and he liked them, etc. So they reinstated the two attorneys. And then, then they, the attorneys filed motions to have Judge Gull removed from the case completely. And a whole bunch of other things. And then the prosecution put out the information that was going to be in that hearing. That the defense team, originally when the prosecution and the judge talked about having a gag order, the defense team said, we don't need a, a gag order. We're not going to be talking about this in public. And then a day later, they get in front of the mics and talk about the case, talking about how their client's innocent. They did it. And they said, uh, you, you already broke that. So then they imposed a gag order. And then during that time, they sent out documents that are private documents to a felon out there accidentally you know they sent it to a felon these documents of the witness list then they um, hey thanks 1L Michelle again when it comes to Delphi there's absolutely no one that can touch at Gray Hughes well thank you and then after uh, that person got those emails I think the next one was that's when they put out the Franks memorandum that had all the crime scene information and I don't know how many people put a one if you've all uh, anybody who's read a lot of the Frank's memorandum I put a one of you read a lot of it or I mean we've gone over it on here a bit I think it's one of the most disgusting uh, poorly written documents that's ever been written it's it, it even admits at the top that it was meant for public consumption because it says if you're not familiar with the case we thought we would well who wouldn't be familiar with the case who would be reading this if it wasn't it if it was under the gag order no one that can touch it, Ray well thank you for the nice word so um, <laughs> anyways the, the document makes it out there and it talks about stuff like one ma how could one man acting alone using dexterity remove a an arm from a shirt pulling the arm out and then that same person using dexterity acting alone finishes pulling their arm out of a shirt and then that man acting with dexterity how would he then 
take the other arm and play. It was so stupid. I did a, a parody using Mr. Rogers putting his shoes on and his sweater in the, in the closet, and it sounded exactly the same. You, they try to make something so mundane and simple seem hard, and it was referring to the crime scene and how it turns out that Libby, uh, she was nude at the crime scene, and there was a branch laying down her left side and then a, a couple branches crossing over her and then uh, Abby also has a branch going down her left side and a couple other branches and uh, it, there's no Odinistic thing and then he said there were antlers and there's no antlers or anything like that but there is there part that is interesting is that um, Libby's jeans and sweatshirt that she had on were on Libby so they were actually Libby, I mean Abby, excuse me. So the Libby's jeans and sweatshirt were on Abby's body. So when they found her, you know, and Abby had jeans on, but they were tight jeans. So likely what the situation was is the person dressed Abby, maybe they felt something more for her, and they put clothing on her, and the way she was found is her hands were kind of curled up inside of her sweatshirt up like this. You know, near like kind of like she was cold, and so that makes you think that she uh, maybe was alive because it mentions that in the document. And they talk about how she was, um, you know, living longer and how she was killed so many times in a row. It's like they were almost—it was just sadistic, almost that document. And then they actually cited one of the most ludicrous YouTubers there ever was. This guy from, I think he claims he's from Australia, maybe South America, uh, combination. I call him Slow Joe. He's the guy that came out and um, he said that um, he, he goes after the family every single video. He thinks that they're all part of this huge cover-up, this massive, and he's absolutely wrong. He's an, an, an embarrassment. Um, if you remember the movie Time to Kill, where Matthew McConaughey um, does the court scene at the end, he asks people to close your eyes, and then he describes what happened to the victim. Well, he did a video where he didn't think anybody r would remember Time to Kill, so he did another one crying with the same exact sort of feelings at the same exact time. Uh, describing the Delphi case. He goes, close your eyes. Do it, do it, yeah. And it was literally the same script. So I made a video calling him out on it, and he goes, well, I, I thought that... I, it was blah, 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 blah. And everybody knew... You, at that point, if you didn't realize that that guy was full of crap, then, you know, there's something wrong with you. Gray, why are you talking about it? Because this guy is... Not only that, he threatens to actually kill people, and he goes after the family every single day, right? And his name is mentioned on this document. You're just jealous. Oh, God, I'd be ashamed if my name was on that document, okay? I can just tell you that right now. They found the craziest, most lunatic. You know what they should do, the defense team, or the prosecution? is say, look, we see this uh, memorandum here, you guys. And we notice that you cited this person here. Now, can we play you some of the uh, video clips that this guy has done out there? Let's play some of those. Do you know how stupid the defense team would look at that point? I mean, don't you guys see what I'm saying here? Like, the prosecution should take the fact that they cited a wacko nut job and play some of the clips that he's done set out there where he threatens to actually kill people yeah i wouldn't doubt it like the uh and then okay so after the odin document was put out there and it was leaked crime scene photos were leaked and then an investigation took place into what was going on here with the defense team. Early on, see, when 
uh, Jerry Holman originally got the task of looking into the leak, he, he wasn't sure where the leak came from. But early on, they were able to determine it was from the defense team, and the defense team admitted that it came from them. Because there was a guy named Westerman. And the story that they, they told was that Westerman came to visit them. He used to work for Baldwin. And Baldwin. So he goes into the office, and he's sitting around waiting in the conference room. And lo and behold, there's crime scene photos sitting there on the computer, on, on the table, whatever. And he starts taking pictures of them. Oh, yeah. That's what everybody does, man. They start taking pictures. He's, that's what he did. But then in this rebuttal recently, we hear that it was much more than that. Uh, but anyways, let's continue with this line here. So they do this investigation. Uh, Westerman says he went in there. And then he was... Um, and then during the investigation, the actual leaker leaker, the one who gave the photos, because Westerman gave them to a person named Robert uh, Fortson. And then Fortson gave it to another person named, um, I mean, his name is Mark Roberts, right? And Mark Cohen is another name he goes by. So they gave it to him, and he was out there putting the videos out. I mean, the images. So... But it turns out that Robert Fortson killed himself, right? He actually took his own life. He, um, and so all of these things, think of all the stuff that, that happened there. First of all, they broke their word and talked about the case. Then they broke the gag order by putting out the memorandum, and they also uh, sent sensitive information to a, a convict who then posted the information online. Um, then uh, crime scene photographs were released and the investigation led to it coming from the defense team and a guy named Westerman and then during that process somebody killed themselves. So you guys think that these attorneys are good people? They're, they're just piles of crap in my opinion, of course. And then remember this, everybody. I don't believe the story that Westerman went into the office and started taking photographs. Do, do many of you guys, any of you guys actually believe that one? The story that I think is true is that, because um, we found out later that he was given a copy of the Franks Memorandum in support of, or in a memorandum in support of the Franks hearing the Odin document, and it had all the attached photographs of the crime scene. They admit that. So there'd be no reason for Westerman to then go in and take photographs. They just needed to say that that's how it happened to try to cover for themselves. Does everybody realize that? I mean, doesn't that just make the most sense? Because if you say, yes, we gave it to Westerman and he disseminated the photographs, it would look like you were involved with the dissemination of the photographs. But once the investigation happened to save Rosie and Baldwin, Westerman had to bite the bullet, as it were, and say, oh, yeah, I was in the office and I got those photographs. Because why would you need to do that when you have the freaking photographs already with you with the document? Come on. <laughs> Let's do a poll on this one. I just want to see where we're at. Let me see. Did I'm going to do two ant things for you. Did Westerman um, let's see, put out let's see. Give docs give images to Robert Fortson from ah god, that's too hard. Let's see. Um, did Westerman? I'll explain. How about I'll just do two choices and I'll tell you what they mean. Let's see. Office. Um, Frank. Yeah. All right. So here's what your choices are going to be. Did Westerman? That's the question. 
and then it's let's see uh, get images from office or Frank's memo that's really what uh, I want you to answer here so did he, did he actually go in there and take photographs in the office or did he get them get them from the Frank's memorandum and that's exactly they said they gave it to him and it had all the attached images doesn't that make more sense See how wild this case, I mean, it got so far away from the Abby and Libby element. Man, there's people that really believe that he went in there and did the Westerman. You guys are crazy, Jesus. You guys think that he went into the office and took photographs in there when he was given the freaking memorandum with the attached photographs why would he then need to go take photographs of the same photos he already had? <laughs> you guys are crazy. Of course he got him from the Frank's memo. He already had the images. Why would he need to take photographs? He, he's got them. He's, he's got them at home. He, they're sitting with him. And he goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. Let me take some more photographs of the same images that I've already got. No. So what he did was he took photographs of the images in his own Frank's memorandum and he gave them to uh, Robert Fortson. And then once the it all hit the fan, they say, listen, listen, you can't tell them that we gave you the memorandum with the attached images, okay? You have to go, you have to tell them that you came to our office and you photographed these. I mean, I, I just think it's so obvious. This is one of those things that's like, so for the people who said office, can you tell me why you think that? No, go ahead. Yeah, I do too, Jillian. That's what I've said many times. I think it was planned. They wanted the memorandum released with the Odinism and all that crap. They wanted the photographs released because they thought that it would help them. Look at the way these sticks are placed here. Oh, man, maybe somebody will look for antlers. and They wanted all of that out there. So I want the people up there that say, did Westerman get image? Maybe they're just answering technically, like they didn't know that I'm setting up the question here. Right, I just realized that. <laughs> okay, I just realized that maybe, let me, let me redo this freaking thing. All right, I'm gonna redo the poll. I just realized, maybe I can answer it better. Do you believe Westerman got the photos um, do you believe in reality that Westerman got the crime scene photos from the office or Frank's memorandum attachments. <laughs> okay, hopefully this is worded better. I, I hope to God we've got a better uh, ratio than that. All right, let's see. I don't think there's any way that they that that story is true and I never thought it was true even at the beginning because who would do that to her, your friend anyways go into a, a an office and start taking photographs mm -hmm. and you guys we've sort of hit a lull here so again if you'd like to help support the Gray Hughes Investigates YouTube channel that'd be great make sure to check in at the end of the month and see what we do with part of the funds I always notice that on donation night we have literally a third of the viewers pretty strange don't you think it's like yeah 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 that's great that's great that's great but you could actually see what we do you know I think there's a lack of physical I mean I actually make an income too on YouTube yes an affidavit in Westerman's case says art I observed printed copies of photo evidence on the conference room table. I took pictures of a few of them. Yes, yeah, so what? 
Yeah, we know that. Yeah, we we know what it says, Dan Danny. <laughs> We've gone over it fifty thousand times on here. I just don't know what you're trying to say there. Um, and he wouldn't have needed to take pictures, is what I'm telling you, because he already had all of those images because they were attached to the Franks, uh, the memorandum in support of the Franks hearing. Okay, that's already there. I don't think there's any way that, I mean, I think you'd almost have to be a troll uh, in the votes up there to think that he really did get it from that when it's already been told to you that he was given the Frank's memorandum that had the crime scene photographs on it and then the images were given to Robert Fortson. Why would he then need to be in the office with Baldwin and take photographs of the same crime scene photos that he already had? How many times, I mean, it's weird to have to explain it again because it doesn't seem to register to some people out there. Hey, thank you, Amber Maiden. Well, anyways, this time it's a little bit higher. Only 23 uh, mentally challenged people, 23%. Great, I just believe him. I believe Westerman. How dare you? It doesn't mean you're you're mentally challenged. It just means that you are willfully ignorant. Okay, that's okay. I mean, that means it's a choice. Uh, ding, 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 ding. Amber Maiden, she's got a wave up there, you guys. She's the one that, uh, when she does the wave, a lot of times people just ignore the wave attempt. And she tries hard. <laughs> And by the way, how's it going? Uh, how much longer do you have to wait here, Amber, for the, the the jaw situation? Yeah, it's crazy how critical thinking is lost on a lot of people. It just doesn't work. They can't think out of a shoebox. Let's do this. Ocean wave. Ocean wave. Uh, hey, thanks, Kami. Look at that. Somebody jumped on. Amber Maiden, look at... You weren't left alone this time. Looking like an April, May should have a surgery. Oh, nice. Man, you've been waiting. I mean, I would bet... It seems like it's been like two and a half, three years, hasn't it? I mean, it's been ridiculous. Or more, even. I mean, it seems like at the beginning of the pandemic, you were trying to... I mean, what a long journey that's been for you. Everything looked good, and then they go, well, we can't do it, and then you have to switch over to somebody else. And you deserve it to be a completely flawless situation. Mm. Right. Right. Look at that, though. up there, 24% of people literally believe that Westerman took photographs in the conference room. When I just explained to you that he had a copy of them already. <laughs> Is that, you're, you're going to stick with that, or? Wow. <whistles> Holy moly. All right. So here we go. I think this is, I like this one better than the other one. Uh, this, this document in here because this is one at the end where it talks, it added more information at the end. Plus it had people's names on it. So now we're going to go through this again. We went over this a few months back uh, for the third time then. But I think when you go over this, you'll see just on the information that's in this document how it's incredibly likely to the fact where I believe 100% that Richard Allen is the killer here. I don't think it's some Odinistic, uh, crazy, you know, uh, conspiracy theory, nonsensical. 
You know, I've noticed that nobody ever has an answer. Can anybody tell me again? Let's just do that Odin thing again. So let's say Odin, Odinus, Richard Allen's totally innocent, and there's these Odinists. So Richard Allen's innocent, right? And then there's these Odinists who did the killing. So why would they need to have Odinists in the prison watching him? Like, what was their purpose in there? To make sure that he, he remains guilty? or I mean, I, I, how does that happen, technically? Hey, thanks, uh, Sonia. All right, here we go, here we go. We're going to go over it right now. Uh, do you guys need to have this somewhere on the screen? Because it's hard to get them. Maybe I can... I go like this, perhaps. Let me get myself out of here, off the screen. Thank you, Sonia. Wait, what did, uh, let's see. See, Eddie Shirley said, people don't have critical thinking skills because at least when I was last teaching, our elementary students were only taught to memorize enough to pass the state testing. <laughs> well, there you go. I think it's more like, this is what I think it's more like. People have an idea in their mind. Those 27% up there are likely people who think Richard Allen is innocent. Therefore, they need to believe that, um, what is this right here? Is this, this for in here? What is this thing? Uh, I don't know what that is. I can't end the poll, I have to go over here. Let me just... So they have like tunnel vision, right? So they don't have the ability to accept the reality of almost flawless logic uh, that I just gave you a minute ago regarding the, the need to take photographs of images you already have, right? That'd be like uh, you already have a newspaper at home and then... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't even know how it is. You take a photograph of the newspaper so you can read it while you're sitting at home in front of your own newspaper. Uh, it's just, well, maybe they wanted to read it on their phone, Gray. Okay, okay, bad example then. The Odin ceremonies just uh, teach how to pack fudge. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the broken scout is... Uh, what Honda Elantra 300 video? I didn't delete any of those. I haven't deleted anything. Why did you delete your Honda Elantra Chrysler 300 video? Huh? Was it a live stream or a video? I don't even know what you're referring to. I think it's still out there, actually. Hold on. Let me see. There was a video that I removed because it had so few views, and I thought I would upload it again later. Let's see. Uh, or maybe it's, uh, is it a... Yeah, I think I put that one out and it had like 2,000 views after a full day. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to upload it again at a different time. I first made it for members only. And then I, it just, it wasn't worth it for me. I mean, you, it has to have more views than uh, 2,000 views in a whole day. That's just garbage. You know, so that means I wasn't in the algorithm. And I thought I'd upload it again at a different time. 
And so maybe, let's see, what day was that? That might be a good one to re-upload. Thank you. Appreciate that. I was trying to look for something. Um, you didn't get the notification. All right. But you know what's weird is, why would you care, Blotera? <laughs> you guys are so paranoid. It just, it just drives me batty how paranoid you guys are. It's always something. There's a real... There's always another reason behind something. It's something else. It's what was in there that you wanted to hide. Remember the other day in the video I said something about, uh, yeah, so this I'm showing you this. This is what I want you to see right here. And they think, ooh, he was hiding something else that would have sold some another part of the story. And it was just a totally mundane. And I even knew when I said that. I go, oh, God, watch this. And then there it is. Yeah. Right. All right. Here we go. So it says right here on February 14th, 2017, Abby and Libby were found deceased. I think it might be, oh, we'll see what order it is, but Abby and Libby were found deceased in the woods, approximately 0.2 miles northeast of the Monon High Bridge. Here, let me, let me move this over. And that's right here. And that's about right. It's about 0.2 miles just around this corner here. And I flew around that corner. Let me see if I can find it really fast. Delphi. Is it that one? No, I think it might be the X2 that I... Wow, look how huge those are, man. Is that the one? Oh yeah, see, there it is. And so what you're looking at right now is that same arc around. So if I went back over to here, watch. There's the bridge, see? There's a bridge right there, and then it goes around this corner. And that's what we're looking at in uh, this photograph right here. So there's the bridge. The drone's probably like right there. And then it goes around the corner, and here's that shallow area over here. And that's what it looks like. So you turn around, there's the bridge. Come around, and then dry, fly forward. <laughs> pretty cool. I put a 360 degree camera on top of my uh, Mavic 2. It's got a little bit of distortion. But Man, that's pretty clear. You can see right into the water there. I can see a fish swimming around. There's the shallow area right there. Alright, so I made it to about right there. The girls were made to cross right over here. And then I think they made it up this other bank. So a lot of people when they go out there, they go down over there because the bank looks more dramatic and high, but over here it's kind of low. And in the map, that would be like somewhere like right around in here I'd have them going up and the GPS coordinates that they put in the Logan document they are right here for the crime scene but uh, that's not where it is I think they don't want you to be right at it so it's right there it isn't over here it's uh, behind these trees and I don't know why they have it off by a little bit there but are you saying that you're right and they're wrong. Well, I'm saying that that's not where the crime scene is. I know exactly where it is because there was a... Even when Julie Melvin went down here, you could see the crime scene tape right here, and it wasn't over there. All right. Let's see. So 
So uh, their bodies were located on the north side of Deer Creek, which is right over there. And I'm going to be reading now, you guys, so I'm going to need some of that energy funds. You know what I'm saying? At the time, the Monon High Bridge Trail was an approximately one-mile gravel trail terminating at the Monon High Bridge. The Monon High Bridge is an abandoned railroad trestle approximately one-quarter mile long spanning the Deer Creek and Deer Creek Valley on the southeast end of the trail, approximately 0.7 miles north West of the trail from the north western edge of the Monon High Bridge is the Freedom Bridge. All right, so that's right over here. So 0.7 miles from right there to here. That's the Freedom Bridge. And that's somewhat new. If you go back, I usually use the April 2017 map. But if you go back, see in here, it's not even there anymore. And there's the CPS building when it was still in use. And it looks totally different now, the landscape out there. Look at that. Just one, in a two-year period, it went from looking like that to like this. And that's basically the general shape of it now. And, or even in 2017. The trail terminates just west of the former railroad overpass. The majority of the trail is in a wooded area with a steep embankment on the south side of the trail. The entirety of the trail and the location of the girls' bodies were and are located in Carroll County, Indiana. Through interviews, reviews of electronic records, and review of video at the Hoosier Harvest Store, investigators believe victim one and hey, thank you again, the Broken Scout. Victim 1 and Victim 2 were dropped off across from the Mears Farm at 1.49 p.m. All right, so Abby and Libby were dropped off right over here at 1.49 p.m. And that was by Kelsey German. And so they, it's right here, really. This is the Mears property, and that's the parking area. This camera here however, there's a camera right on the building there, picks up um, Kelsey's vehicle when it drives by, leaving after, so I would say like 148 they were dropped off, maybe. And then she took off and at 149 her car is captured on that camera. The Mears Farm is located on the north side of Country Road 300, right right here. Near an entrance to the trail, right there. Uh, the Mears Farm is located... Okay, we got that. Um, a video from the victim... So Libby is victim two, shows that at 2.13 p.m., Abby and Libby encountered a male subject on the southeastern portion of the Monon High Bridge. The male ordered the girls, guys, down the hill. No witness saw them after this time. No outgoing communications were found on the victim 2's phone after this time. Their bodies were discovered on February 14, 2017. The video recovered from victim 2's uh, from victim 2's phone shows victim 1 walking. So that means Abby. She's walking southeast on the Monon High Bridge. That's why my animation is really accurate. She's literally still on the bridge. While a male subject wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks her. Walks behind her. So that means behind Abby you see this guy wearing the jeans and the jacket. As the male subject approaches victim one and two, one of the victims mentions gun. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls, guys, down the hill. The girls then begin to proceed, and law enforcement believes they can hear a click sound of the gun. A still photograph taken from the video and the guys down the hill audio was subsequently released uh, to the public to assist investigators in identifying the male. And I believe that it's that photograph that they put out there that led Richard Allen 
into contacting law enforcement and saying and he wanted to get ahead of it. You know how people do that a lot, right? They try to get ahead of a, uh, a crime. They sort of interject themselves and try to get ahead of it. Victim 1 and Victim 2's deaths were ruled as homicide. Clothes were found in Deer Creek belonging to Victim 1 and Victim 2. There's photographs out there of that. South of where their bodies were located. There was also a 40 caliber unspent round less than two feet from the victim to, from Libby's body between victim one and, and victim two's bodies. The round was unspent and had extraction marks on it. So it was a, a full bullet, you know, inside the shell and everything, and it was just, you know, it was, it was ejected. You know, like someone clearing, you know, like the ch -ch -ch, you pull it out and a bullet comes flying out. <clears throat> Let's see. Interviews were conducted with three juveniles, RV, BW, and AS. They advised they were on the Monin High Bridge Trail on February 13, 2017. They advised they were walking on the trail towards Freedom Bridge to go home when they encountered a male walking from Freedom Bridge towards the Monin High Bridge. So they're actually, they're saying that they saw a male walking there these three girls, there's actually four, but uh, three of them saw him. And maybe the fourth did, they just didn't interview her. A.S. described the male as kind of creepy and advised he was wearing like blue jeans and like a really light blue jacket and his hair was gray, maybe a little brown, and he did not really show his face. That describes Richard Allen really well. The jacket's darker than that, but they all saw the same person. She advised the jacket was, another person said she advised the jacket was duct tape canvas, or she still said that, it was like duck canvas type jacket. And then RV advised, she said hi to this person, but he just glared at them. She recalled him being in all black and something covering his mouth. She described him as not very tall, with a bigger build. She said he was not bigger than 5'10". RV advised he was wearing a black hoodie, black jeans, and black boots. Now, we just saw the video. You could see, like, how somebody just sort of remembering something later would come up with that. The thing is, is they're all seeing the same person, even though their descriptions are a little different. And we also know this because Richard Allen himself admits to passing those same three girls. Right? So it doesn't really matter what their description is. It just shows you how people's descriptions can be varied because Richard Allen himself admits to being the person they're referring to. Do you understand that? B.W. showed investigator photographs he, she took on her phone while she was on the trail that day. And, and that's actually, um, I think that's one of... I think that's uh, one of Kelsey's friends right there. Showed investigators photographs she took on her phone while she was on the trail that day. The photographs included a photo of the Monin High Bridge taken at 1243. Okay, so that means the girls are right here at 1243. Um, and another was taken at 126 p.m. of a bench east of the Freedom Bridge. So here's the Freedom Bridge, and the next bench is right here. So I think it was 126 right here. So obviously, at 1243, they're here, and they're moving this direction, and this is at 126. And she advised she uh, took the photo of the bench. They started walking back towards the Freedom Bridge. So even after this photograph here, they started walking back this direction. Because that's the Freedom Bridge right here. So they walk towards the Freedom Bridge. BW advised that after she took the photo of the bench, they started walking back towards the Freedom Bridge. She advised that was when they encountered the man who matched the description of the photograph taken from Victim 2's video. BW described the man she encountered on the trail as wearing a blue or black windbreaker jacket. She advised the jacket had a collar 
and he had his hood up from the clothing underneath his jacket. She advised he was wearing baggy jeans and was taller than her. She advised her head came up to approximately his shoulder. And so I don't know. I mean, the height thing is, that might be an issue at trial for people because I think she's not that short, but Richard Allen's pretty short. So She stated he was walking with a purpose, like he knew where he was going. He stated he had his hands in his pockets and kept his head down. Thank you, Janice Johnson. She stated he was walking with purpose, like uh, he knew where he was going. So doesn't that part interesting, you guys? How would he, let's say he's in, he knew where he was going. So it sounds like he knew that Abby and Libby were going to be there. How did he know that? Was, did he have access to that Dropbox account that we were talking about at the very beginning? Is there some connection to Keegan Klein that hasn't been discovered yet that allowed him to know that the very person that Keegan Klein was supposed to meet there that day was going to be there and he was going to take the spot of that person? She advised she did not get a good look at his face but believed him to be a white male. The girls advised after encountering the male they continued their walk across the Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over Old State Road 25. And, and so after this, they walk this direction and they keep walking and then here is the bridge over Old State Road 25. Investigators spoke with Betsy Blair who advised she was on the trails on February 13th. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured Betsy this is where it gets really interesting here. What in the hell is going on with my phone? These guys are just... The investigator spoke with Betsy Blair, who advised she was on the trails on February 13th. Video from the Hoosier Harvest Store, which is right here. This is the one we were talking about. Hey, thank you, Ozzy Trisha. Love you all, my favorite freaks. Oh, that's very cool. That's very, very nice of you. And, uh, so at 1.46 p.m., uh, well, it says right here, video from the Hoosier Harvest Store captured Betsy Blair's vehicle traveling eastbound, and it's driving by this camera at 1.46, right here. All right? So Kelsey drives by at 1.49, and she drives by at 146, so you can probably say that a minute, minute and a half or two minutes before Abby and Libby were dropped off right here, Betsy Blair parked there. And she was there to exercise, so she parked her car, she got out, and she started moving quick, you know, where Abby and Libby, they're just kind of hanging out, taking photographs. They're not in a hurry to be in one specific location. Although, you know, you could argue if there was a specific spot they were supposed to meet, the Anthony Schatz guy, were they also trying to get somewhere? Was just, or was it just, we'll meet you on the trail? You know, who knows? Love you all my favorite freaks. Yeah. But Betsy advised she saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25 as she was driving underneath on her way. So here it is. When Betsy Blair is driving this direction and goes underneath Old State Road 25, uh, she's on Old uh, State Road 25, but underneath the bridge, she looks up and sees the four girls. And there were four girls here. It wasn't just three, but there was um, three that were interviewed. So she looks up and sees those exact same girls that had just seen uh, the guy, you know, the Richard Allen figure walking by. And they, she goes underneath here, drives up like this and around, and then passes the Hoosier Harvest Store at 146 and parks right there. And she gets out of her vehicle and walks this direction. And as she was driving underneath on her way to the park, Betsy advised there 
were no other cars parked across from the Mears farm when she parked. She was the only one there, right? Because uh, Kelsey had just dropped them off and then took off. Abby and Libby. Or, no, at that time there was nobody there yet. Okay, so right when she got there, she was the only car she parked. And then Kelsey comes by about two minutes later and drops off Abby and Libby. But Betsy Blair is already on the trail at this point. Right, so she advised she walked on the Monon High Bridge and observed a male matching the one from Libby's video. So the video that we just watched a while ago with the killer on it, she, um, she saw that person. She said she observed a male matching the one from Libby's video. She described the male she saw as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jean jacket. She advised he was standing on the first platform of the Monon High Bridge approximately 50 feet from her. So he was standing right here and she came to right there and that's exactly 50 feet. She advised she turned around at the bridge and continued her walk. She advised approximately, so think about it like this. Abby and Libby were dropped off two minutes later, and they're walking. They're kind of going slower, so they're going just kind of walking. And Betsy Blair, she makes it to the bridge, sees a guy standing on platform one here, and then turns around, and then look what it says next. She advised she turned around at the bridge and continued her walk. She advised approximately halfway between the bridge and the parking area across from the Mears farm, she passed two girls walking towards the Monon High Bridge. She advised she believes the girls were Abby and Libby. Video from the Hoosier Harvester shows at 149 a white car matching Kelsey German's vehicle traveling away from the entrance across from the Mears farm. Betsy advised she finished her walk and saw no other adults other than the male on the bridge. Her vehicle is seen at the Hoosier Harvest store at 2.14 p.m. leaving westbound from the trails, which is interesting because that's one minute after the video of the killer at the other end of the bridge. Other than just the timing, it's not interesting. Betsy advised when she was leaving, she noted a vehicle was parked in an odd manner at the old Child Protective Service building, which is... Right here. Remember how law enforcement said they wanted to know who the driver was at the abandoned CPS building? Well, it's right here. She saw a car parked there oddly. It was backed in near the building. Investigators received a tip from another person named Terry Wilson, in which he stated he was on highway on his way to Delphi on State Road 25. So he was over here. Terry Wilson was. And he stated he was on his way to Delphi on State Road 25 at around 2.10. And he observed what he thought was a purple PT Cruiser or small SUV type vehicle parked. See, he's just going by memory. Nobody's thinking, boy, I better remember that car. He stated it appeared as though it was backed in as to conceal the license plate of the vehicle. Betsy and Terry both drew diagrams of where they saw the vehicle parked and their diagrams generally matched as to the area the vehicle was parked and the manner in which it was parked. Investigators spoke with Sarah Carbaugh and I guess there was another person too. Um, so it says there was a guy named McWhorter's vehicle seen leaving at 228 and they saw a vehicle look like maybe like a smart car parked there. Now smart cars are really tiny obviously. Um, Investigators spoke with Sarah Carbaugh, who stated that she was traveling east on 300. So here's 300 right here. So Sarah Carbaugh was traveling this direction. And she observed a male subject walking west. So the male subject was walking this direction. On the north side of 300, so on this side, away from the Monadai Bridge. Sarah advised that the male subject was wearing a blue colored jacket and blue jeans and was muddy and bloody. She further stated that it, it appeared he had gotten into a fight. Investigators were able to determine from that it appeared he had gotten in, or were able to, by watching, let's see, investigators were able to determine from watching the video from the Hoosier Harvest Store that Sarah Carbaugh was traveling on CR 300 North 
at 357. So she was heading this way. And it says, through interview, electronic data photographs, and video of the Hoosier Harvest Store, investigators determined that there were other people on the trail that day after 213, and that would be people um, like Cheyenne. There was a girl that got there at like at almost like 215 or so, and, you know, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, I think he, he could hear them, I would think. The wind was blowing from the bridge to the crime scene. Two people were interviewed, and none of these individuals encountered the male subject. So all these people were there, but they didn't run into him. And the reason is because he's off somewhere else, and he killed um, Abby and Libby. Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative. So here's what, that part I mentioned earlier in the show. So think about this part here. And that tip... Now, there's rumors out there. Wouldn't it be awesome if it's true that the daughter and her husband are the ones that tipped in for them to relook at this? Because it just seems so random. What are the odds that, you know, uh, it's just, it's amazing. So investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard M. Allen in 2017. And here's what the original narrative was. This is with Dan Doolin. It said, Mr. Allen was on the trail between 1.30 and 3.30. I mean, hello. <laughs> Let us like right then. He parked at the old Farm Bureau building, he called it, and walked to the new Freedom Bridge. Now, it's actually the um, CPS building. And there is an old farm building, but it's in downtown Delphi. It has nothing to do with this. While at the Freedom Bridge, he saw three females. See, there he goes. He admits this, this is in the original narrative. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember the description, nor did he speak with them. He walked from the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker. So he admits to going to the bridge itself, and he said he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. He stated there were vehicles parked at the High Bridge Trail head, however, did not pay attention to them. And there's, there, was, there was none when he walked by there. And it says right here, look at Dan Doolin's notes. Potential follow-up. Who were the three girls walking in the area? Well, you already knew it was the killer was the guy on the bridge, so who cares? I mean, it's great that you want to go interview them and everything. But uh, when, weren't you looking at the person that was right in front of you? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hey, thanks, Timothy Cecil. Trying for another wave, he is. Investigators believe Mr. Allen was referring to the former Child Protective Service building as there was not a Farm Bureau building in the area, nor had there been. Investigators believe the females he saw included RV, BW, and AS due to the time they were leaving the trail, the time he reported seeing, uh, getting to the trail, and the description of the three females gave. Investigators discovered Richard Allen owned two vehicles in 2017, a 2006 black Ford Focus and a 2006 gray Ford 500. Investigators observed, listen to this, everybody, a vehicle that resembled Allen's 2016 Ford Focus. Now we're back into the um, Idaho 4 case with the Elantra. And it was observed at 127. Remember how Richard Allen said he was there from 130 to 330? Well, this verifies that he was telling the truth. And thank you. So it says, uh, I should wave. I should wave. 127 p.m. traveling westbound on CR 300 North in front of the Hoosier Harvest Store, which coincided with his statement that he arrived around 1.30 p.m. at the trails. Investigators note witnesses describe the vehicle parked at the former Child Protective Service building as a PT cruiser, small SUV, or smart car. Investigators believe those descriptions are similar in nature to a 2016 Ford Focus. Yeah, I mean, they are similar. Like, if you just look at them and you thought, well, driving by really quick, 
See, everyone gets too caught up in stuff like, well, that's not a purple PT Cruiser. That doesn't look anything like a black four foot. Well, if you just kind of look at them, I mean, let, let's just do it. Uh, black Ford Focus 2016. And let's just do a side shot. And so look at look at that right there. See how it's got that shape? You see that? Kind of arcing up and then just slope back and boom. And then if you went like purple PT cruiser, you know, they're not going to look exactly the same, but just in general, watch. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I, I see how somebody, look at the shape. Now you go, well, oh, it's pale as Just if you're driving by quick, at least they have the general shape of it, right? You see that? I don't know how you, I mean, I can see how it arcs back and then goes down. It's kind of like a continuation back there. So if you look at that again and then you say um, 2016 Ford Focus. Or is that what it was? Now I can't even remember. Was it 2000? Yeah, Ford Focus. Side shot. Side view. Yeah, it's, that one's in bad shape. <laughs> but anyways, I hope you can see what they're going. It kind of goes back and then deep in the back, straight drop off, you know. And then let's see what a, one of those smart cars, I bet it has a gen generally the same. Yeah, I mean, I know it doesn't look exactly the same, but watch. In terms of a car, see how it has the same general shape, how it goes back like this and then down. See, so that's what I'm saying. They're driving by. They're not expected to remember anything. And it's just, it is what it is. Okay, they all saw the same vehicle. Richard Allen drove by at 127. See that? He said he got there at 130. They see it at the Hoosier Harvest Store at 127. And it said, uh, which coincides with his statement that he arrived at 1.30. Investigators note witnesses described the vehicle parked at the former Child Protective Service building as a PT Cruiser, small SUV, or smart car. Investigators believe those descriptions are similar in nature. Don't you agree? I mean, I, I agree with that. You know, I, I, I just do. The shape is similar. Not exact or anything, but people are driving by. On October 13, 2022, Richard Allen was interviewed again by investigators. He advised he was on the trails on February 13th. So this is um, the 13th. The, they were at his house and they had a search warrant. And he says he advised he was on the trails on February 13th. He stated he saw juvenile girls on the trails. There you go. Those are the three girls. Now, if you want to believe... Um, so in the Odin document or something related to the Odin document, he claims he got there from 12 to 1.30 uh, when he was brought in and it was interrogated. Now, why do you guys think he would do that? Well, he would do that because he knows that that's an important time frame. So now he places himself outside of the time frame. But here's the problem. He admits to seeing the same three girls that the three girls claim, you know, they see him, right? So if that's true, then that means he got there at 1.30. There, there's no escaping that because they were leaving as he was entering the trail. But he thinks, well, if I throw the, uh, I don't know. It's just, it, to me, it's obvious he's doing all the classic uh, cover up things now. He's at, he's interviewed years later where now he knows the time frame is more important. He, he thought he was dead to rights at the time. So he admitted he was there from 1.30 to 3.30 because he thought they had a picture of him and he was like, yeah, I was there from 1.30 to 3.30. He didn't say he killed anybody. He just said he was walking the trails. He was on, on the bridge. And But now, years later, after he just couldn't believe it. I think that's why he turned into a hobgoblin or he looked sort of similar to Golem from Lord of the Rings is because for five years it ate away at him. He was just living on borrowed time. He couldn't believe that Dan Doolin, who got his 
information, it never made it anywhere. Nobody asked him another question again for five years. Right, so, so he told investigators that he was wearing blue jeans. Listen to what he said he was wearing, everybody. Here, let's play... Um, let's play this again. And I'll read what he says he's wearing. He stated he parked his car on the side of the old building. He told investigators that he was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. He advised he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. <laughs> yeah, because that's not the guy on the bridge there. He further claimed he saw no one else except for the juvenile girls he saw east of the Freedom Bridge. He told him that it, so that means he doesn't admit to seeing Betsy Blair. Maybe he didn't see Betsy Blair. She might have seen him and turned around. Who knows? He told investigators that he owns firearms and they are at his home. Richard Allen's wife, Kathy Allen, also spoke to investigators. She confirmed that Richard did have guns and knives at the residence. She also stated that Richard still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. Yes. Here, just a second. And I think, as I've stated before, that the hat that he was wearing, he said he was wearing a head covering. Now, what does that tell you? Because we've gone over this before, too. Yeah, when somebody says head covering, it's probably something like this, right? Because... Um, you know, if you're wearing a baseball hat, you would just say I was wearing a baseball hat. Most people don't, this, the name of these aren't readily in your head. Okay, it's a beanie, it's a, other people have these other names for them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's interesting is look at the, uh, you can't see it, so hold on a second. So see that hat right there? I think that's the hat he's wearing. Or one just like it. That's just my opinion. And now watch the video again. Watch this. Look at that thing. And it even comes out and you, there's a shadow off the one. I think he's wearing that hat and there's a hoodie bunched up behind him. Yeah, right there. Oh, and how, how about this for a uh, creep factor? This is his daughter right here who looks very similar to Libby. And she's even wearing one of the Abby and Libby tie-dye shirts in the photograph. Then there's a picture of his daughter uh, on the bridge <laughs> uh, again. Uh, look at that. I mean, how weird. I mean, what are the odds of that? Well, it's pretty good, Gray. A lot of people live around there, you know. And Richard Allen's wife, Kathy Allen. And by the way, isn't this stuff super chat worthy, you guys? I think so. Richard M. Allen's wife, Kathy Allen, also spoke to investigators. She confirmed that Richard did have guns. On October 13th, he was interviewed, uh, among other, uh, let's see, on October, investigators executed a search warrant, so that's when they interviewed him too, but it, they executed a search warrant, and they located a P226 40 caliber pistol. Between October 14th and October 19th, the laboratories performed tests on it, and they, it determined the unspent round found at the crime scene within two feet of Libby's body had been cycled through Richard M. Allen's Sig Sauer Model P226. What did I do? What did I do, Timothy? So mean. I didn't do shit. Thank you, 655. The laboratory remarked an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class characteristics. 
So what they're saying is there was ejection marks on the bullet and it matched Richard Allen ejection marks of other samples from the Sig Sauer P226. What, was I mean though? I wasn't even mean, you guys. <laughs> Alright, you you're throwing me in prison though, right? Oh, jeez. Man. Are you just throwing me in there for uh, good, uh, good measure tonight or what? Oh, and you get to see blue. There you go. There's blue. Waiting patiently for something to eat. Poor blue. He's just... If I could just get one bite of something, I'd feel so much better. If I could just have a bite, just something, just even the smallest morsel of something to eat. Is there going to be... Are you ever going to give me something... Just anything. I'm waiting. I'm waiting patiently. I know it tastes really yummy. That's why I shake. Just waiting. Waiting to get something. Please. Please. Man, you guys are going to leave me uh, b uh, in prison here, huh? I don't get it. Huh? Yeah, man. I'm, I, it takes this guy. I'm, I'm going to be bailed out. I was tossed in prison by Timothy Cecil and Cindy. Wow, you guys. It's not like the old days where you guys would get get me the hell out of prison. Maybe you like seeing. I don't know what you're saying, Michelle. No idea. For the blue commentary? Yeah, I'm pretty good at that. I make my wife laugh a lot. Like, I'll we'll look at blue and I'll pretend I'm his voice. I actually should make videos on that. I have a whole different channel. Because <laughs> I think I can do it pretty good. Like, I know what he's thinking and everything. Hey, thanks, Cindy Lynn and Cindy J and Quietly Frozen. The coolest name in YouTube history. All right, I'll get the hell out of here. Oh, look at Chloe, though. That's pretty cute. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. If you're going to go get something, I'm going to get something. I don't know if there's any out there. I just thought I would do it myself. I don't watch other people's videos like that. All right, you guys. You guys got me enough to get out the door and start walking down the highway. No Uber, no hotel, no nothing. I don't even know what this person's saying. Cindy J, he'll make comments like, a lot of people live around there gray. Uh, like we're agreeing with, we're not. Dis I don't even know what you're saying. Can you type a better sentence? I does anybody even know what that means? For the blue Nobody knows what that means though. Can you type a better sentence? Or is it just girl code? Uh, like is it means something back? to other people. I... Oh, I'll be back if you want me to. Does anybody know what that means? Oh, cool. Thank you, pancakes. Does anybody know what this means? Cindy J. He'll make comments like, a lot of people live around their gray. Like we're agreeing with you, we're not disagreeing. What? what? God, that's one of the worst. Like, I, I don't have any idea what that means. Well, you don't have to hide her from anything. You know? Yeah, let let me be the hider, unless there's somebody that, you know, that trashed the channel, okay? I mean, I don't know if that one, I don't think that one rose to the level of being hidden to you. I don't know why they said your name. Um... 
no, you, uh, Cindy J said, Michelle said you're me. And then, yeah, I think you're great, but you can be, oh, I see what you're saying, like above that, she said you, I thought she was being uh, joking, because isn't that the term, so mean, <laughs> right, I mean, that's the whole thing, that's, I think it's pretty funny, yeah, well, see, I think what she was doing was trying to create a scenario for herself where somebody was mean to her, because is anybody going to be polite to somebody who comes into a channel and trashes the host and then the host sees it and then uh, they're going to be polite to that person? Oh, Jesus. Anyways, we're almost, we're almost through this. I lost my control panel over here. Oh, I gotta get rid of this jungle panel clown over here. I don't know if they're still there, but... Okay. There we go. Yeah, I saw that part, but I didn't understand, like, the part before that. <laughs> Who cares? Anyways, you guys probably did the right thing. I didn't have time to read this stuff. I went up and saw one, so you did it right. That's right, I remember I was... I'm going to leave it up to you guys to make the right decisions. Well, a lot of people say I'm mean. I don't care if somebody says I'm mean, you know. If somebody comes in and goes, Gray's mean, I don't go. I mean, obviously we've heard it a million times. That's why we have the uh, emoji, right? I mean, like, that's what this whole thing is. Look at Right there. And even, uh, remember when Kelsey did the audio where she said, Gray is so mean, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I just don't have tolerance for bogus crap. Okay, so. See? All right. Carroll County Sheriff Department Detective Tony Liggett has been part of the investigation since it started in 2017. He has had the opportunity to review and examine evidence gathered in the investigation. Detective Liggett, along with other investigators, believe the evidence gathered shows that Richard Allen is the male subject seen on the video from victim 2's phone who forced the victims down the hill. Further, that the victims were forced down the hill by Richard Allen and led to the location where they were murdered. Through the statements and photographs of the juvenile females and the statements of Betsy Blair, RV, BW, and AS. Now, Betsy Blair, she describes uh, somebody, she's the one that was responsible for the younger sketch being released, and she tells everybody, uh, you know, she's the one that wanted them to put that out there because she thought it was a younger looking person, but she also said that the guy on the bridge is the person she saw. And Richard Allen says he's the guy on the bridge. I think Betsy Blair is just remembering it differently. I mean, I mean she was pretty adamant about it, so that's going to be something in the in the defense uh, corner. And then also the Sarah Carbaugh, they couldn't find, the defense said it doesn't say muddy and bloody anywhere. Okay, but obviously there must be a place where it says that somewhere. Uh, they just didn't put it in their Odin document or whatever document that was. I... And then it says the they walked the entirety of the trail and observed one only one person, an adult male. Betsy Blair's vehicle is seen on the Hoosier Harvester video at 146 and leaving at 214. And she stated she only saw 
uh, one adult male. So that means when, the whole time she was walking on the trail again, I mean, that's a really interesting part there that I, I don't think I ever give enough credit to is uh, this. Watch. So Betsy Blair's right here, right? And she just continues to walk over here and then back. And she didn't see the guy, the same person at any time. But she walked like this and like this. So that means she would be ahead of the Richard Allen character here, right? She'd be ahead of him the whole time. And then she'd come back and she should have passed him at some point if he was leaving. But she didn't. She leaves. So that means that Richard Allen is in, at minimum, this area right here, or even outside of that, I'd say like right in here, all the way up until the um, 2.14. And which is more likely, he's at the other end of the bridge being filmed at 2.13. Investigators believe Richard Allen was the male scene by Betsy Blair, actually, the, the what I should say is he would be between, um, let's see, since she left right there, so this area right here is where Richard Allen would be in that time frame, all the way up until 2.14, just based on her observations. So right like this. And in fact, he's over here, at the other end of the bridge at 2.13 when she is getting into her car and driving away. Investigators believe Richard Allen was the male seen by Betsy Blair, RV, BW, and AS, and the male seen in Victim 2's video, or Libby. Richard Allen told investigators he was on the trail from 1.30 to 3.30, Video from the Hoosier Harvester shows a vehicle that matches the description of Richard Allen's vehicle passing at 127, thus verifying that he came in towards the former CPS building. The clothing he told investigators he was wearing matched the clothing of the male in victim in Libby's video and the clothing description provided by Betsy Blair, RV, BW, and AS. A vehicle matching the description of the 2016 Ford Focus is seen at around 210, 214, 228, and that's the PT Cruiser, smart car, and a small SUV. Through his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to the Monon High Bridge and walked out onto the Monon High Bridge. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was seen on the trail after 213, was not seen on the trail after 213. Because that's at 2.13 is when he's seen on video. And he's never seen by Betsy Blair on her entire walk. And not by any of the other people who showed up after that. Uh, what's going on? Well, we don't have the, the jailhouse confession. I don't get it. Anyways, this, this summation here is pretty good. Uh, through his own admissions, Richard Allen walked the trails and eventually hiked to the Monon High Bridge and walked out. A male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 2.13. Investigators identified other individuals on the trails or CR 300 North between 2.30 and 4.11. None of those individuals saw a male subject matching the description. So now he's going to say, well, I left between... It was 2.14, and I was already gone by 2.29. Yeah, give me a break. Furthermore, Richard Allen stated that he only saw three girls on the trail who investigators believe are RV, BW, and AS. Yeah, unless you believe there's another set of three girls that never came forward. Investigators believe Richard Allen was not seen on the trail after 2.13 p.m. because he was in the woods with Abby and Libby. An unspent 40 caliber round between the bodies of victim 1 and 2 was forensically determined to have cycled through Richard Allen's Sig Sauer Model P226. The Sig Sauer Model P226 was found in Richard Allen's residence and he admitted to owning it. Investigators were able to determine that he had owned it since 2001. Richard Allen stated 
He had not been on that property where the unspent round was found, that he did not own or did not know the property owner, who is Ron Logan, and that he had no explanation as to why a round cycled through his firearm would be at the location. Furthermore, he stated that he never allowed anyone to use or borrow his six-hour model P226. Investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down CR 300 North. Investigators believe he was seen by Sarah Carbaugh walking back to his vehicle with clothes that were muddy and bloody. Tony Liggett, along with investigators, believe the statements made by the witnesses because the statements corroborate the timeline of the death of the two victims as well as coincide with admissions made by Richard Allen. Further, the accounts relayed by Betsy Blair, RV, BW, and AS are similar in nature and timestamps on photographs taken by BW correspond uh, to the times the juvenile female, sa uh, female said they were on the trail. Investigators believe Richard Allen committed this kidnapping which resulted in killing a victim or of Abby and Libby. So the, that would be felony murder right there. From their prior conclusions, investigators believe Richard Allen was the male depicted in Libby's video saying, guys, down the hill. They believe Richard Allen was carrying his six hour P226 on that day due to the cycled round matching that firearm was located a feet from Libby's body. They further believe he was carrying the six hour uh, model P226 from the audio from Libby's video in which investigators believe they hear the sound of a gun being cycled and one of the victims mentioning a gun. See, there you go. That was stuff that we knew a long time ago. The investigators believe after that, vic after that victim one, Abby and Libby were removed from the bridge by Richard to where, they murder, where the murders occurred. Charges were filed against Richard M. Allen on October 28, 2022 for two counts of murder. Now, he's already, he's got two more added to him just recently. Uh, once Richard Allen was taken into custody, he was moved to the Westville Correctional Facility, which is part of the Indiana Department of Corrections for Safekeeping. He has been in said facility since November of 2022. This is before some of the more recent stuff. When Richard Allen entered the facility, he was placed in the segregation unit for his protection. In the segregation unit, his cell is equipped with a video recorder which records his activities within the cell. There are also logs indicating when Richard Allen leaves the cell and for what purpose. He also is being seen by medical providers and mental health specialist to evaluate his physical condition and monitor his mental health. Richard Allen also has the ability to use a tablet in his cell to send text messages, make phone calls, and listen to music. Upon Richard Allen's arrival at the facility, he was placed on suicide watch because of certain statements he made about harming himself. Throughout his stay, his mental health improved to the point that he was taken off of suicide watch. He was also participating in recreation time and beginning to exercise. The facility reports that he was doing well and that they had no issues or concerns. His day-to-day -day demeanor was that he was quiet, read a lot of books, did crossword puzzles, and exercised daily. So there you go. On April 3rd, 2023, Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen. In that phone so look at th what they're showing here is right before this, he was doing well. He was exercising daily, all these different things. Then, on April 3rd, 2023, Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen. In that phone call, Richard Allen admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the phone call transcribed and the transcription confirms that Richard M. Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. He admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offense, uh, offenses as charged. 
His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly. Soon after, attorneys for Richard M. Allen filed an emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. Of course, because now it's like, oh, God, this is so damning. Jeez, what do we do? Ah, oh, now listen, Rich, Rich, Richard. Start drooling on your shirt and acting crazy. Now, I'll tell you what, anytime anybody hands you a document, just start chewing it up, all right? Well, we got extras. We got a spare in the back. Just start chewing that sucker up. We're going to ask for a transfer, and it'll all look like you were just mentally being screwed with, and we can get these confessions thrown out at some point. Because, of course, you said all that while you were crazy. Allen's mental state has declined because Westfield Correctional... So look at that, right after this, right? Soon after, attorneys for Richard Allen filed an emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. In that motion, the defense states that Richard Allen's mental state has declined because Westfield Correctional Facility is unfit. Oh, don't forget the odinous. That he should be moved. Defense also makes allegations that his mental health has declined to the point where Richard Allen has been deprived of his constitutional right to assist in his defense of this case. Further, defense alleges that his mental capacity has declined because of his um, incarceration at Westville Correctional Facility. Defense is also challenged. <laughs> God, I, I know I can't help but feel sorry. I oh, forget it. Defense has also challenged that his treatment is unconstitutional. Soon after, investigators made aware of the warden of Westville Correctional Facility at Richard Allen began to act strangely. <laughs> so right after he confessed and his wife hung up abruptly and called his attorneys, they came up with a plan to make Richard Allen seem crazy. That's how, this is what, this MO is exactly what his attorneys do. Do you hear, look, look at what we're talking about right now and look what they did with Westerman, pretending that he took the photographs it's all smoke and mirrors with these guys. Let's see. Uh, Richard Allen was, was wetting down paperwork he had gotten from his attorneys and eating it. He was refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. He would go days on end refusing to sleep. He further broke the tablet that he used for text messages and phone calls. He went from making up to two phone calls a day as of April 3rd, meaning the day that he confessed, to not making any phone calls at all. What a, you know what's a, you know what? I got to tell you what it is incredible. I mean that he just happened to go crazy on the very same day that he confessed to his wife and mom. <laughs> Man, talk about bad luck. Unlucky Richard Allen. Remember that? Unlucky Brian Koberger. It's just it's the same shit. The same defense team, basically. Uh, on April 14th, Richard Allen was he evaluated by two psychiatrists and one psychologist to discuss his turn in behavior and whether or not there was a need for involuntary medication. The panel would also discuss moving Richard Allen to a different facility that has a psychiatric unit. From that meeting, it was determined that Richard Allen did not need voluntary medication and that he did not need to be moved to another facility. Since that meeting, Richard Allen has begun to eat again and has begun to sleep. Uh, so but really what it was, it was like a temporary insanity where it was just like right around, it was just like a two-day period where he confessed to his wife and his mother, and, he, and then he just started going nuts off to the side, okay? And then he, you know, he comes back out of it again. Investigators believe the information that Westerville Correctional Facility has gathered since Richard Allen was placed in that facility is important to the investigation. Investigators believe that there is video evidence that will include his admissions plus his behavior prior to the admission and directly after. See, it's tricking. 
And it's exactly what his defense team does. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's weird now to think back. It's like the tactics the defense team is using with Richard Allen here, faking him being crazy with the drooling on the shirt, matches exactly what they did with Westerman and all the stuff like putting out the document and then going, oops, you know, just a lot of fake crap. Huh. Anyways, uh, I think that's it, you guys. I, <laughs> what do you think? I thought that was a pretty good recap tonight, though, didn't you think? Went through the whole thing. FBI would contact him for a formal... <sighs> Yeah, well, he, he's the one that called to make uh, his appointment with Dan Doolin. Richard Allen's the one that called in the tip line himself. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, why wouldn't somebody else interview him later, right? And why would they send Dan Doolin out there? conservation officer he's obviously he's probably pretty good at uh, determining how many fish are in the water but when he sees a a guy that was at the bridge from 130 to 330 he wonders about the girls he passed uh. and if you're out there hit that subscribe button if you're not a subscriber here all right, so one, two, three, hit the subscribe button. And then also hit the notification bell. Uh, so you guys have any questions or anything? I think that probable, that probable cause for me is really a good one. <laughs> you know, it's circumstantial, sure. But where's the video of him killing them, Gray? Where is it? Where's the video of him specifically driving the vehicle gray god you bastard yeah see what i mean the same people are in they tried to do the same thing in the Al Alec murdoch case they tried to do the same thing but yeah they didn't really work out for those people so now they're in the Idaho 4 and the Delphi case. All right. And if you, you know, thought I did a good job tonight, uh, join the channel, uh, help support it in some way, that'd be great. Thank you very much. And I really wanted to see Dan's testimony. Well, of course, we're, you know, at some point they're going to, you know, if they have a trial, they'll say something. You know, we'll get to see what Dan Doolin says. Apparently he doesn't have... Um, wasn't recorded or something. I don't know. I don't know. I think this one is just as much as the Idaho case. I don't know. I think, well, the Idaho one to me is more... I don't know. <laughs> the whole thing is... is they're both clammed up where we don't really get to have the real good information that they have. Mm, nah, I don't really suspect he did other crimes. But, anyways, what time is it? Right, he hung up the phone right away. Call the lawyers. I just told. I just said that a minute ago, Sandy. They, were you not paying attention? Or do you suspect he did other crimes? Wonder why I abruptly hang up the phone. 
because she was like, oh my God, he's, he's saying too much. And then she was like, man, I got to talk to the attorneys. What, what do we do? He's, he was recorded saying those things. That's what the phone call was about. Mm -hmm. Well, it just got dead as a doornail here. So time to take off. In the chat, like nobody's typing. I guess there's a few comments that rolled in there. No, you're you're wrong, Mr. Shane82. You're just one of the nut job uh, conspiracy nutters. Okay. Yeah. Brian Koberger is going to be the killer, and will he come back on here and apologize for your idiotic comments that you make? Thank you. I was answering, oh, well, you just said exactly what I said a few minutes ago. You got to tag people when you're responding to them, Sandy, or they don't know that you're talking to them. The way you tag is you hit the at symbol and you start typing their name and then it shows up and then you hit enter or you tab over so it selects it and then you keep typing. Yeah, I'll cover those trials for sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, people are crazy. Uh, hey, look at that. It's Dana Dane. What's going on? How's it going? And by the way, who's going to get the other Chloe notebooks that we have? You guys? Where is it? You guys, uh, you guys were wanting me, oh, you got to make the Chloe notebooks. You got to make the Chloe no notebooks. And then when I get them, you guys don't buy the damn things. Look at these. You don't think these are, look at that. That's freaking awesome. Chloe right there with the GHI. Uh, you get a stress ball. Chloe signs it. You get a, a sticker now. Look at these cool uh, sticker comes not in it. Like I'll, it, I just stuck it on there, but... Get a sticker, stress ball, and a pen. If you send $30 to my PayPal, I'll ship it off. I've got a couple already. I'm just waiting to uh, ship them off. I, I need more to do it at the same time. But if you send 30 into the PayPal, I'll ship it off and sign it. So come on, you guys. Let's get the notebooks. I've got a whole, st like, stacks and stack, a whole nether box filled with them. And man, the excitement. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't wait, can't wait. And then. <laughs> yeah, okay. I guess we'll think twice about ordering those boxes next time. Yeah, Sandy Shirley got some. They're good. With all the other stuff going on that night. Hey, Mr. Shane, you're a conspiracy nutter. I'm sorry. Your brain doesn't work correctly. You bought too much into the clown, the guy from England, all the weirdos making videos on it you bought into. And that's unfortunate for yourself, but, you know. You, you can't help it. That's the way you're you're wired. Let's see. With all the other stuff going on that night, what? There's nothing going on that night. But what about the three guys at Banfield, Gray? Right? Well, guess what? Um, Koberger didn't even get there until three twenty-six. Banfield was at three o'clock. Okay. Well, how do we know? Ooh, boom. All right, who's buying the notebooks? I don't see any in here.
Yeah, with all the other stuff going on. Nobody? Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you guys, uh, it's been uh, almost three hours here again, so we're going to call it a night. Thank you to the Broken Scout, Dana 1972, Quietly Frozen, the coolest name in YouTube history, with a double cat eye, then Sirius Black, Kim Christian, H. Doc gifted a membership. Oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gift membership, too. Here we go. I am going to gift memberships. Just make sure to stay one after the time runs out. Yeah, it's weird. Whenever I do the Delphi shows now, I lose subscribers. Yeah. Whenever I do Coburger, I gain subscribers, even though I'm, a, I'm the same person. But what you do is you get these trolls that show up, and they get upset if you... Because... Earlier, when people believed that Westerman took the photographs, if you're one of the idiots that left when I said that your brain isn't working correctly, if you think that he took photographs of, of photographs he already had, and you thought that was offensive, <whistles> wow. That's embarrassing. Let's see. Maybe I'll start going back to the, you know, the thing where I give away uh, notebooks or something to people who send in, uh, you know, like a spin weighted on super chats, right? That way I can give, you know, start getting rid of some of these notebooks. I don't, I don't have a way to get rid of them. Nobody's buying them. You guys were so excited about them. No, they're on. You just send me to PayPal. You send thirty dollars to PayPal, and in the note you say, "I'd like a notebook." And then usually your address is on the PayPal, but if it's not, you just type it into the PayPal. It's not in my store or anything. You just send a PayPal in, and then I put you on a list, and then I do all the shipping and everything myself. All right. So make sure to check out those accounts and when they were created, you guys. Right, anyways, I didn't continue. Uh, so we were at K Me and then One L Michelle, Cindy Lynn, Don Bucolic Buffalo, Cindy Lynn, Linda Howe, Jessica Schubach, Susan Smith, Wise Child, My Little Cutie, uh, Georgina Stoliker. Kathy Frydenmaker, my one L Michelle, Kathy Chapin, Amber Maiden, and K. Me, Allie Cake, the Broken Scout, Kathy Chapin, Sonia, the Broken Scout again, and then Janice Johnson, Ozzy Trisha, Timothy Cecil, 655, the Broken Scout, Cindy Lynn, Cindy J, Quietly Frozen, Pancakes, and then I gifted five memberships. All right, good. Oh, thank you. Dallas Rose. Yeah, so if you're out there and you want to get the notebook, you know, you just... Yeah, that's it. Well, we got to figure out a way. You got to... 
cover the Delphi case a little bit more, though. I feel like uh, I'm kind of, I don't know. I don't know what to do, though, with it, though. It's just kind of like we were just stuck in a, just all the legal crap that's going on. All right. Well, anyways, I appreciate you guys all very much for uh, supporting the channel tonight. Maybe consider getting one of those notebooks if you want. You send 30 to PayPal. If you live in UK or Australia, it should be 40 because shipping is like 20 something. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, um, you know, if you send 30 to PayPal, you do get the blue notebook, the pen, a heart shaped stress ball that says freaks on it. And then uh, and a sticker, too. There you go. Are these trolls showing up at the last minute? Oh, yeah. Do you really care that much about the... Hey, let me ask you something. Eight minutes, uh, whatever the hell your stupid name is. Do you think that's really a big deal, that speeding ticket? Honestly, do you think it's a big deal? Is that something that you think... It's uh, like it's really clever and funny and cute. Like it's something they even. Yeah, I got a 36 mile an hour and a 25, everybody. Oh, what an egregious travesty. And these idiots from the Idaho 4 case, they think they're so clever and funny and interesting. And look at me, you know, and they bring up the speeding ticket as if that's a big deal. Like it's a. Uh, a horrible time in American history. You remember that speeding ticket? Oh. It's amazing, man. <laughs> it's a really gather. It's almost scary how childish these people are. You know what I mean? And a three and a two and a goodbye. Yeah. Okay, everybody. I appreciate y'all being here, and we will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be the last day. I won't be able to do a show on um, Thursday, Friday. Maybe I'll. But I might try to do one from where I'm at. You know, like I've done. <laughs> we'll have to see how the internet is, though. That'd be pretty cool. But I appreciate all your support. We'll see you tomorrow. And as I always say, until next time, be safe out there. And, you know, let's get some justice for Abby and Libby, for God's sakes. Uh, this is crazy right now. Yeah, I've been doing this true I'm not crime going to crime for quite a while now. And during this whole Doesn't time, sound very I fun. have not seen one person that is a... Crime dissector, flag rejecter, I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya on a stretcher if you try and play me like an old projector. Crime uh, sector that's not on the news. is my I nectar. <laughs> Professor Gray is gonna give Every another night. lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector with all respect. Just remember, I've a temple for conjecture. I have no agenda. I'm the pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, That's right, quietly I'm gonna frozen. send you on a mission <laughs> to reveal the true offender. You <laughs> without the blender, yeah, so I'll and I'll right serve it to you work. straight right, without. <laughs> serve it to you straight without the blender. That's a pretty good line in there, isn't it? I'll serve it to you straight. I'll give it to you straight. I don't. Put it through a blender, you know, and try to make it, ooh, ooh, throw all this garbage in there, right? It's just a straight-up water. Boom.